don't know.
So what I want everybody to do right now is have a seat. I want you to close your eyes and just listen. I want you to try to focus in on this moment as if God's just sitting beside you with his arm around you. And um, this is kind of a different scripture to use to focus on communion. But I, for some reason, God was like, this is it. So John 14, starting in verse 1, Jesus is talking to his disciples. And they're starting to get this idea that maybe he's the Messiah. Maybe he's the son of God, but they're kind of like, I don't know, he's on the earth with us, right? They're, like I refer to them all the time, 12 chowderheads. They kind of get it, they kind of don't. But they're still following him. And Jesus is now beginning to share more and more parables about the coming kingdom of God, one that's already here and not yet. And so he gets to this portion in John 14 that um, the apostle John shares and he says <laughs> this is Jesus words let not your hearts be troubled believe in God so this is directly from Jesus to the disciples because he knows their questions he knows their doubts he knows hey wait a minute you know I'm kind of a chatterhead I don't know if I really know what I'm doing here <laughs> right anybody else ever feel that way and Jesus is trying to reassure them despite sin Despite your shortcomings, despite what you think about yourself, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me, in my Father's house. So here's he starting to vision cast and paint a picture of heaven here. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. So that sounds like Jesus wants to hang out with them, right? But this is also a message for us. He wants to spend time with you. And there's nothing going on in your life right now that can't be laid aside and at his feet that he won't gladly say, all right, I've been waiting for you to ask. I'll take it. Let's spend time together. Let's spend quality time together. Let me convince you of my love. That's communion. In verse 4, he says, and you know the way to where I'm going. So he's implying they already know. <laughs> but Thomas, big doubter, right? Thomas says, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? He's thinking of some earthly place, right? Thomas, he's the only one with enough guts to say it, I think. That's the way I view Thomas. He gets a bad rap being the doubter, but I think he's the only one with enough guts to say, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. <laughs> And Jesus then said to all of them, he said, I'm the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So he brings it right back to this relational faith. He's trying to convince them, listen, it's not about the systems it's not about special prayers. It's not even about sin. It's about if you exert faith in me, then we're good. We've connected. We're in communion. So the beauty of communion is it's not supposed to be a down in the mouth, oh, woe is me, I'm full of guilt because all the junk in my life moment. It's supposed to be a moment of celebration where you realize all you have to do is ask him to take the sin from me and forgive me. All you have to do is say, God, there's so much stuff that gets in the way from me really having strong faith and belief in you and knowing that you love me. Please take that away so that I can focus on that. That's what you mean it's about. And there may be some of you this morning, maybe you're watching online, I don't know. 
you're like, you got your longer list out. Yeah, yeah, get through communion because I, you know, there's so much stuff. God doesn't want to hear me, hear it. He does. Whatever it is that's weighing heavy on your heart, on your mind, I'm not enough. I'm too broken. I'm too unhealthy. I struggle with this. I struggle with that. You don't know the sins I committed. None of that stuff matters if you ask him to take it. He is quick to forgive. He's quick to love and show himself. If you're quick to say, all right, God, here it is. Take it away. And that's all you have to do. This morning, whatever that is, I want you to imagine it in your hand and you're placing it out there to God and say, please take it, Lord. Remove the things that distract me from who you really are. The lack of faith, the sin, whatever it is, the hurt, church people take you off. That might be everybody in here, right? Put it right there and say, God, take it. It's done in Jesus' name. Do you believe that? Amen. Amen. All right. So now, these guys are going to keep playing. When they do, if you get a couple of these, grab one. Do the right side first, right? Get that little, you know, leave the adjectives out. Wafer out of there. Chew that up first. Drink the juice on the other side. And we know those are symbols. See, Jesus, he was body was broken, he was whipped, beaten, almost put to death before he even got to the cross because of the torture. And his blood was shed all along the way. Why? So that we can connect and be in communion with God. He paid the ultimate price for us. And that's what we celebrate in communion. And I hope that, because even though sometimes it's graphic to think about somebody being whipped and beaten and nailed to a cross, we ought to be grateful that it wasn't us. And we get to be forgiven and free and truly loved by God, even far more than we understand. So go ahead. Oh 
<laughs> we'll just give them a second. Sorry, I should have prepped them. Come on up, Pastor Tony. You're getting some daggers. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Either come up or she's taking you to Iowa with her. It's <laughs> 20 hours. <laughs> Lord, we love you. We just pray over Megan right now in Jesus' name. Um, Lord, we pray for safe travels. And Lord, we pray that you would go before her. And Lord, you've been preparing the road for her all these days. And Lord, now it's her chance. And Lord, I just pray that you would lead and guide her, that you would be with her. And Lord, that you would just protect her. Lord, I pray against anything that's going to come in her way, Lord, that you would just be with her, you would lead her, and you would guide her. And Lord, I just pray that she knows that we love her here in Brockton, but we're super excited to send her. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, um, there's one more request before you leave today. Megan has said that she loves jokes about corn. Oh, God. <laughs> She's going to Iowa. I know Kathy's not here, so you dodged the bullet today. Right? <laughs> Kathy's been saying the same exact joke about corn for like, what, four weeks now? <laughs> How's everybody doing? Three of you. Man, did you guys play hard yesterday or something? It's a deal. All right. So this morning, um, I want to share with you, uh, like most of my sermons are my own little conviction moments with God. Anybody ever heard the phrase, eat your words? You're going to eat your words, right? Okay, the, the four or five people that said they know that, it's because you have, right? <laughs> if you're like me, you've shot your mouth off, and somebody's been, you're going to eat your words. Usually that happened to me on the basketball court. But, um, eat your words. And I was thinking about that phrase <laughs> in relation to, um, I don't know if you're like me, but there are many nights when I lay my head on the pillow, I kind of review the dumb stuff I've said all day or from like third grade. You know, anybody ever do that? Like, I'm the only one? Oh, okay, a few of us here. This sermon's for you today. <clears throat> and I just, like, sometimes I just lay on my pillow and I, I'm like, oh my gosh, why did I see that? That's the, gotta be the dumbest thing anybody's ever said. Nobody else has that moment? It's just me, okay. So anyway, I had this idea about eating your words. And I, uh, we recently were celebrating a song called My Champion, right? From camp, teens, remember? You guys wake? Oh. Yeah, I can't get anybody to respond this morning. Anyway, it's a great song, and there's a lyric in there where he says, I am who you say I am. Anybody else heard that song yeah. and love it? It's a great song. It, depending on which version you get, some of them are like 42 minutes long. But it's a great tune, and I love that lyric when he says, and at camp, God was doing something to me when that guy sang that lyric, I am who you say I am. Anybody else ever you experienced that with that lyric? And here's why. It's in contrast to this thought, eat your words. And so I started going down this rabbit trail of, well, God, why does that lyric hit me so? And um, he began to convict me about all the garbage talk that I speak over myself. Now, I know I'm not the only one that does that, whether you're going to admit it or not. But I think it's a part of our human nature, right? We go over our, our mistakes, we go over the things we say and we do, and we're so hard on ourselves that we begin to repeat 
the things that we are we recognize in us that are shortcomings. Anybody, you still with me? So like, I have horrible like foot and mouth disease. I I say stuff before I even think about it. I'm just, it's just my personality, and I've come to love and hate that about what God's created in me. Because I'm like, Bleh! and then I'm like, oh, why did you say it that way? And, and so I was thinking about this eat your words thing, and God was convicting me and saying, listen, it's like a diet. Your words are like a diet. So if you try to cut back on the bad stuff that comes out and replace it with good stuff, you actually would see that lyric come to pass in your own life. Like, I would sing that lyric, I am who you say I am, without going, I ain't nowhere near that. So I know that some of you have said that about yourself, right? You're like, why, why did somebody say that I was awesome? Because I'm not. Anybody else have that negative self-talk sometimes where you're so stuck in the mistakes and the things you've done in the past that you're like, all right, I'm a loner because you've been alone. All right, I had a broken heart. I'm broken hearted. All right, well, I got all these, I'm, so I'm just physically broken. And you just repeat it. And you don't even consciously think about it sometimes. Why? Because you're eating the words that have been spoken over you. Even by yourself. And so this morning, I think the challenge that I want to get across is that what God's been doing to me is, listen, if you keep saying that you're a loser or that you're just a, a mess up that God has redeemed, you're not going to get anywhere near what I've called you to do in, in your life. So when are you going to stop saying that about yourself? When are you going to eat my words? Get where, get where I'm going now today? Words are powerful. I want to read this portion of scripture. Turn with me Proverbs 18, verses 20 and 21. There's a food theme, and it's not just because I'm hungry. It just is. I don't know why. But. From the fruit of a man's mouth, his stomach is satisfied. He is satisfied by the yield of his lips. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. That, I mean, you think about two little statements in scripture that are wisdom proverbs are kind of like little wisdom sayings. There's a lot packed in there, right? If you pull that apart, you say from the fruit of a man's mouth his stomach is satisfied. So what you speak more of is what you are going to digest. That's basically what it's saying. Right? Anybody disagree with that statement? What the majority of what you speak is what you digest. So, take you back to the self-talk thing. If all you do is talk about how bad you are, dumb you are, in, in you know, whatever, all the deficiencies that we can make up as human beings, what are you going to digest? You're going to digest those things. The beauty is, in the second part, death and life are in the power of the tongue, those who love it will eat its fruits. It also means if you turn that over and start to speak God's ideal over yourself, you start to speak God's ideal over your own mind, your own heart, guess what you do? That's what you digest. That's the fruit, right? All right, two people with me. <laughs> Proverbs 15, 2. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouths of fools pour out folly. I, <clears throat> unfortunately, this scripture has spoken more about me, the latter in my life, than the, <laughs> the beginning of it, right? When we think about if we're wise, we will do what? <laughs> we will kind of think before we speak, right? 
Otherwise, we get this. Go to that next one. <laughs> Everybody else love the Flintstones? Yeah. Some of you young guys, you don't even know. You don't even know. Flintstones are the best. Foot and mouth disease. <laughs> All right, let's move on. The words are powerful. Anybody else understand the meaning of that statement that words are powerful? Can I get a raised hand or a yes or throw a tomato or something? Right. There's power in our words. And that's for good and for bad. Right? Many of us have regret over some of the words we've spoken. Over our own life, over friends, family. Right? Can't take them back, but we can counteract them, can't we? If we increase God's ideal and his word, his love over ourselves, over others, it starts to drown out all the negative junk that's piled up in us. Genesis 1-3, it's amazing when you think about how speaking, speech, words are tied to how God's Created. And so Genesis 1 3, we read the creation account, and there's 15 plus statements in the creation account in chapter 1 where it says, And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. So then he goes down through that whole thing, right? God's power is tied to his speech and speaking over creation. I think, here's my little epiphany I had this week about it, is because the breath, when he breathed into Adam, when he breathed life, it's also in his speech, because we can't speak without also breathing, right? So the Holy Spirit oftentimes is equated to God's breath as life-giving force. Isn't that amazing when you think about, like, okay, take that back to me. What am I slinging? with my words when I'm speaking. That's, that's heavy. If you think about some of the dumb stuff you say in a given day, right? It's like, oh God, help me. Let's, let's good stuff outweigh the bad more today. Genesis 2.19 Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. So not only is God's speech powerful, he's giving mankind power with their speech. Have you ever thought about this before, that your speech, whether it's good or not good, there's power tied to it. Why? Because God made it that way. And so you think about, like, for some of us, you know, I, I had friends in high school, not friends. I wouldn't describe them as friends. I had people in high school that cut me down so much that I started believing the things that they would say about me. And I don't know, maybe if you're like me, I flipped that around years later and then I started doing the cutting down. There's power in what we speak over people. Right. And you think about our society nowadays, right, where it seems like people are hurt by every word in the English dictionary. Right? Why? Because there's something innate God's created in mankind there's power in words. So the responsibility then is, what are we going to do about it? How do we use that power? We use it for good or not good? I want to point out one more thing in um, the Old Testament, Ezekiel 37, 1 through 6. Often throughout scripture, especially the Old Testament, you see these characters and you read some of these stories and you think, whoa, 
really? Wow. How come we don't see that stuff nowadays? The prophet Ezekiel is a, is a good example where God started to give Ezekiel these prophetic messages that he wanted him to share. But it was tied to like visions and dreams and it's very like, I mean, he could create a, a sci-fi movie or something off of it because the imagery is just, it's awesome, it's powerful. So in Ezekiel, he takes um, Ezekiel in, in this vision dream thing to try to convince him the power of his words and he brings him to this vision of this huge valley of nothing but like dried up skeletons and bones. So let's read. Ezekiel 37, 1 through 6. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he brought me out in the spirit of the Lord, and he set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. And he led me around among them, and behold, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and behold, they were very dry, meaning they've been dead for a long time, right? And he said to me, <clears throat> Son of man, can these bones live? And of course, Ezekiel responds, and I answer, Oh Lord God, you know, that's a coward's way out, <laughs> right? You know, like, what are you talking about? No, <laughs> but he didn't have enough guts to say no. <laughs> Only you know. And then he said to me, Prophesy over these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, Behold, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews, like connective tissue, upon you, and will cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So he charges Ezekiel, Listen, when I ask you to give a prophecy over my people, Know that it has life. Not because of you, because me. And he gives us the same power today. Like, we have a choice in any given moment to bring life or death by what we speak. That's heavy. I know, I get it. Because I'm guilty a lot of my time in my day of just bleh, junk speech. Right? And I have to eat those words a lot. Like, God, forgive me. Or I talk to whoever I speak to and say, please forgive me for saying that. That was dumb. That was not a good choice. Right? But the beauty is, is that we can keep learning and moving and growing in this power that God's given us to speak life over the world around us. Life over ourselves. We can do that. You can go to that next slide. I mean, we all know Martin Luther King Jr., right? I have a dream speech. Do you think he got up that day to share that speech knowing it would have the impact that it's had on our national psyche? He probably didn't, right? There's interviews of him prior to giving that speech where he said, that was like three or four different speeches that I kind of put together. And then when I got up, I finally ad-libbed anyway. I mean, think about the moment that God ordained for him, the legacy left by him because he imparted life, I would have said. He was speaking into dead stuff in our world at that time. Dead stuff that's still hanging around today. Racism and just all kinds of junk, right? And he spoke scripture, he spoke to God's ideal, he painted a picture of heaven, right? What love's really supposed to be about. Speaking in a crowd where half of them, they probably wanted to kill him at that point, at that point, because his influence was getting so strong. But what did he do? He spoke life anyway. You might not ever have that kind of moment, but it doesn't matter the number. <laughs> the life you speak in any given moment, that matters to God, whether it's to one person or a crowd of 100,000 or whatever it was, probably a million, right? We have the responsibility to bring life or death out of our mouth. I know, I know it hurts. I got it. 
hurts me too. I feel it. Romans 10, verses 9 through 10. As followers of Jesus, it starts here. You want to get a, like a little plugged into the power source to transform your speech, to bring life, so you can enjoy eating the words that you're slaying instead of going, ah, oh, why did I say that? It starts here. Paul's writing to the church in Rome. For Moses writes about the righteousness that is based on the law and that the person who does the commandments shall live by them. But the righteousness based on faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven or who will ascend into the abyss. But what does it say? The word, the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Paul's reminding them, it's not the religious systems that save you. It's not your sinless life that saves you. It's the fact that you speak it out on a regular basis, Jesus is Lord. When was the last time you told him? that he was Lord over your life. Oftentimes I find myself guilty of just asking him for stuff. God, help us get a better vacation. Help us have a better car. Help us enjoy our summer. Help the summer to go slow, right? We throw stuff at God all the time and ask him for stuff. When was the last time you paused and said, thank you for being my Lord, Amen. the Lord of my life. I resubmit myself to you, your authority, your lordship, be the leader of my life. See, the thing that has become too easy, I think, in our American, Western, Christian society is that we can raise our right hand and say yes to Jesus, but then we take the Lordship right back from him. Say, well, I got it from here, God. See you, God. It's not what he asks. He asks us daily. Are you still mine? That's a, that's a tough pill to swallow. It's tough words to eat, but that's where the challenge lies today. Do you start your day with a conscious thought? Yes, Jesus is Lord. I'm going to say it again. Regardless of how I lived yesterday, Jesus, you're Lord today. Verse 9, I'll say it again. Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. For the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I think we need to speak life after over ourselves more often. Like the essence of this scripture. If Jesus is your Lord, if you say you're going to follow him, when you wake up in the morning, say it over yourself. So what? Lock the bathroom door and say it in the mirror. <laughs> right? Maybe you got to do that to turn it into a habit. Because i got to tell you, there's a lot of mornings I get up and I'm like, oh, another day, right? But what if I got up and said, thank you, Jesus, for being my Lord. <laughs> Maybe I wouldn't have words that I'd have to eat that I don't like. <laughs> Maybe I'd start off the day a little bit better 
Anybody else with me? All right. This next, uh, this next little point I want to make, though, is about our faith. And it says that in uh, that portion in Romans, if you believe in your heart, that's good. But it's also, it puts in there, if you have confess with your mouth, like you have to say it. I think there's something about that. God ties the power of our words to the action. There's an action. So it's not enough to just say, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. I don't think that's going to get you very far in life. When it comes to saying that you're a Jesus follower, like your words got to match what you say is in your heart. Am I right? Anybody else ever found that? I like this nice, this next story. Um, <clears throat> Luke chapter 7, 1 through 17. It's a story of Jesus healing a centurion's servant. Anybody read that story before? I think I've shared it from the pulpit too. It's about this very thing, about... <clears throat> Him recognizing the power of Jesus' words to bring life. So in verse 1, after he had finished all his sayings in the hearing of the people, he entered Capernaum. Now a centurion, so this is a military guy, Roman military guy who has lots of people under him, who commands a bunch of people, had a servant who was sick and at the point of death who was highly valued by him. So this servant of his, he loved, like he really loved this person, and it was important to him. So when the centurion heard about Jesus, he sent to him elders of the Jews asking him to come and heal his servant. And when they came to Jesus, they pleaded with him earnestly, saying, He is worthy to have you do this for him, for he loves our nation, and he is the one who built us our synagogue. So... Imagine Jesus standing there, these Jewish leaders come to him and say, Hey, listen, before you argue, this guy's worth listening to. So I don't know about you, but if I was Jesus, I'd be like, All right, then I'm not listening. <laughs> Nobody else would do that. That's my own. Okay, all right. Sorry, that's why I'm up here speaking. Chief Target. I just would be like, Okay, so you say he's worth listening to. But it got God's attention, right? So Jesus went with him. When he was not far from the house, the centurion sent friends saying to him. So this is a message from him. He sent friends out to stop him before he got all the way to the house, his house. Lord, do not trouble yourself, for I am not worthy to have you come under my roof. So here's a Roman who in that day, in their society, would think Jews are dogs and worthless. Now flipping the script and saying, I'm not worthy of you coming to my house. So just Jesus' reputation of what he'd been doing on the earth is enough to catch the centurion's faith. Therefore, I did not presume to come to you but say the word and let my servant be healed. For I too am a man set under authority with soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. So when Jesus heard these things, he marveled at him, turning to the crowd that followed him and said, I tell you, not even in Israel have I found such faith. So he's... He's turning around and basically slamming the faith of the Jewish people to say, not even among you guys have I seen such faith. That's how much Jesus is impressed with the centurion's blind faith to say, just say the word and I know that's enough. I share this story, well, and in the end it says the servant was healed. I share this story because how many of us have stuff going on in our life that we get the lowest knees about 
and we don't open our mouth and say, God, just say it. I'll be healed. Just do it. And that's anything. Listen, I, there's some crazy stuff going on in a lot of our Church on the Rock family members right now. We've got, what, four, four people in the hospital right now that we know of? There's cancer, there's all kinds of stuff. One, one woman's at home because she knows I'm done. I'm tired of fighting cancer. I mean, there's all kinds of stuff, right? But how many of us are willing to say, God, do it, heal them? That's a charge to all of us, not just the pastors. How many of us don't even do that in our own life? God, I just, and I've been guilty of this for the year of my testimony last week, the last nine months grieving over my dad. I guess I'm just going to be sad. I guess I just got to deal with it. And God's like, you are? You don't think I can take sadness from you and give you joy? And that's what he did at camp. Probably because he got tired of me bellyaching. <laughs> I mean, I make light of it, but how many of us will just sit in our circumstance and not have the faith of this centurion and just say, Jesus, heal me. If you say it's so, it'll happen. We don't have to call some 1-800 number or go to an event. We just have to ask him, and he'll do it. Or we call a friend or family member and say, hey, you got five minutes? Pray with me. Where we go to someone's house and say, hey, enough of this. Let's pray. He wants to do it. He wants to make us whole. All right. Last one. This is the one everybody loves. James 3. You can go to that next slide. Anybody felt like they fight with their tongue like that? I do. Every time I drive. Especially if my wife's in the car. Yesterday we were driving back from Maine and it was great traffic. Do you think I'd be happy about it? I'm like, dude, did you see that idiot? She's like, really? He was nowhere near you. He's driving like a moron. She's like, will you just stop? Put on some worship music or something. <laughs> How many of us have that daily fight, though? Like, this thing in our mouth gets us into so much trouble, and it's, like, impossible to attain, isn't it? Except for God. James 3. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers. <laughs> for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. Ouch. I feel that barbed wire. For we all stumble in many ways. And if any one of us, anyone does not stumble on what he says, he is a perfect man. Uh, I don't know if I've known anybody. Able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits in the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. This is pretty harsh stuff, right? The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life, set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird, reptile and sea creature can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind, but no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. Whew. Any good news in here yet? Verse 9. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. 
from the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, these things ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water? Can a fig tree, my brothers, bear olives, or a grapevine produce figs? Neither can a salt pond yield fresh water. And then James goes on to speak about how it's only through God's Spirit that we can tame the tongue. But it's when we go back to that Romans 10 and we submit ourselves on a regular basis that puts us in a position the Holy Spirit can actually do it. We have to do the work and make a conscious effort. And I know you guys get sick of me telling the same old joke about having a foul mouth while I'm driving. But God's working on me. I'm finally engaged. She left the room. I don't even get the brownie points. <laughs> but it's because I'm saying to God, listen, God, I know I got an issue. I can't do it without you. He'll help us. He will give us the power to bring more life out of this thing than death. But we gotta live. All right, I'm going to leave you with these couple of scriptures, so I want you to write these down. Psalm 66 and Psalm 51. Your assignment this week is to read them. I'm not going to read them all for you. Because they're long. But what's said in them is powerful. And here's why I've been sharing those scriptures. Psalm 130 Verse 5, I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. So if we want to eat words that we actually enjoy instead of cringe at, we need to rely on his word to shape how we think, how we feel about ourselves, and especially how we speak. Not just to others, but over ourselves. Right? If you got if you got struggles going on, the breakthrough is to wait on him to reshape your spirit. To pour, speak life into your heart, into your mind. Right? Romans 12, the renewing of the mind doesn't happen because you flip a switch. It happens when you submit to his Holy Spirit to reshape you. We have to put our hands our lives in his hands. That's the only way it happens. I love Psalm 66 and 51 because they come from the greatest Bible character in Old Testament history and the biggest sinner dirtbag in Old Testament history, King David. Right? If you think about King David's life, there's nothing about him that would say, Wow, he is a hero for the ages. He killed his own general so he could have his wife. What an amazing guy. He had such horrible conflict with his own children, they wanted to kill him. What an incredible dad. But yet, he's the most celebrated king in Israel's history. Why? Because of the way he repents. Because of the way he tries to put himself back in God's hands when he knows he's messed up. It's his ability to say, I'm the biggest bonehead on the planet, God, help me. And pour himself out in such a way that he wrote poetry and songs to describe how awful he was and how good God was. I mean, that's the only reason songs are in there. So if you want to change the habit of you <laughs> speaking junk stuff over yourself, read scripture, pray psalms over yourself. Memorize them, because you'll get the model of how to submit yourself to God so he can transform you. David, in all his mess-ups and horrible sin, I mean murder, right? Adultery. I mean, horrific stuff. God took him back every time. Why? It's because of the, him recognizing his own brokenness. 
and asking for forgiveness. Wanting to repent. That's what makes David a hero for the ages. And so I leave you those psalms because they're a great way to start learning how to reshape and rethink what you speak. Bringing life to the world around you, to your own heart, to your own mind, the way David did. God, you're amazing, and I am not. It's as simple as that. You want to eat words that are worth digesting? Do that. God, you're an awesome God, and I'm blub, blub, blub. Right? He'll start to reshape it the way you think about yourself. When David reasserts that he's his child, that's when God would meet him and restore him. And we'll see it over and over and over again in the Bible. Every character that we think of and say, wow, that's a cool story of redemption, it's when they recognize their own inability, and but they recognize God's ability despite it. That's for all of us. You guys want a diet with better words to eat? Do you? Yeah. All right, well, let's stand and pray. Ask God to show us how. Lord God, I pray over all of us this morning that we would recognize you give us power in our speech, in our words, over ourselves and over others, over the world around us. And Lord, I pray that we would all be humbled and sober in our understanding of that responsibility, that we can build people up, we can bring life to them, or we can do the opposite. Holy Spirit, only you can tame our tongue we recognize that and we submit ourselves to you. May your power transform us through our faith in you and our submission to you, our devotion to you, today and every day. Lord, help us to be more thoughtful before we speak. Help us to be more life-giving in what we do finally speak. And Lord, that it would outweigh all the negative and all the junk that we experience so far in our life. Lord, I pray for each and every person watching and here, Lord, even those that are, aren't able to join us because they're in the hospital right now. Say the word and they'll be healed. It's only through you that we get healing and wholeness. It's only through you that we get life. And so we pray that over each and every person. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Good morning. All right, it is birthday Sunday. We have a list in the back of August birthdays, and I only see one of these people with us here today, uh, Elvira. Her birthday's on Tuesday. Happy birthday. <laughs> So for all these other people that are not here, if you guys want to grab one of these lists and send them some birthday cards, especially there's a few people that like we haven't seen in a while, so I'm sure they would be super excited to get a birthday card from us. All right, Ladies Ice Cream Social was rescheduled to this Thursday at Crescent Ridge. You can meet us there at 6 p.m. Um, and you can talk to Pastor Rita for more details. She's not here today, but you could send her a message on Facebook Messenger or call her or whatever you need. Um, if you have some concerns, but it's pretty straightforward. Show up, eat ice cream. That's it. <laughs> All right, and then we also have a sign-up going on in the back for the church picnic um, and our baptism. So that is happening next Sunday. What we need from you is a couple of things. Number one, if you are interested in being water baptized, we need you to sign up. There's a sheet for that. Number two, if you are coming... We need you to sign up for a dish to pass. So something, think potluck, you know, something you can share with us. And also the third part of this is we're asking for a $5 donation from every family to help cover the cost of the meat, okay? 
Um, obviously feeding everybody all those delicious hot dogs and hamburgers um, comes at a cost and we just want to cover that, okay? If you have other questions, you can definitely talk to any of the pastors, um, especially the, the part about getting water baptized. If you're not sure if you want to do that or you have questions, concerns, you want to talk it through, what is this going to look like, please talk to us and we'll help you out and help you um, figure out if that's the right thing for you for next Sunday. Okay, also, since today was Communion Sunday, we're asking that you dispose of your own trash, please. And especially to my friends with all of the delicious Dunkin' Donuts, there's like little straw wrappers and things, but don't make your mom do it, you have to do it. Cool? Okay, so please clean up. We will have, the, actually it's already there, the trash can is already at the back for your convenience. So your little cups and then any other trash that you brought into the building. All right, and now we're just gonna pray over our offering. Jesus, we thank you so much that we can give. That it's not a requirement to love you, but it's an opportunity to show you. And I ask, Lord, that you would bless the givers, that you would bless every dollar that goes into that plate, that it would meet the needs of our, our church family, Lord, and that you would have your way with our finances. We thank you, Lord, for this service. Lord, be with each of us as we leave today. And we ask all of these things in your name. Amen. All right, you're dismissed.